I'm Mayor Derek Armstead from the city of London. Uh, I am one of the commons of CD10 uh, because I'm noticing that uh, more and more communities like ours, it's very difficult for people to maintain their household uh, and just to exist. High cost of health care, food, housing has become a real issue for our people. And uh, communities just like ours, I'm watching us being pushed out. Gentrification is imperative, it's real. And uh, in my town, I have put measures in place to prevent it from happening. Uh, and we hope to bring that same strategy at the congressional level so that it will stop occurring in towns like Jersey City, Lenden, Walwood, Roselle, uh, where we're primarily housed, the low and moderate income families, but all over for the stadium, and we have to figure out a way to allow them to stay. Good evening, my name is Carmen Bugo. I'm running for Congressional District 10. Uh, a little bit about me, I was born and raised in the foster care system. I lived on the streets, nearly lost my life to drug addiction. Now I'm living the American dream. That's what I plan on bringing back to District 10. I've been walking in this district and people are tired, they're disgusted. When you can't put food on your table, when I walk into a building and there's kids sitting on a bed and the house smells like mold, this is just unacceptable. It will not happen and it will be fixed on my watch. I don't believe in band-aiding anything. We've band-aided things for generations or decades, I'm sorry, and nothing has been done. You've been made promises and nothing has been delivered. You've been given money and that money's been used by political bosses to give to their friends and family to do jobs. I am telling you right now, mark this day, that you will see more entrepreneurs come out of these towns than you've ever seen before. That is one of my goals. I truly believe in three things that are happening in our, in our country today. Uh, illegal immigration, safety, and housing. And they all intertwine into one. I will not allow our children to be, have to be, able to, to be able to play on the streets. And my time is done. I'm sorry, I didn't see 30 seconds. Good evening, Good evening everyone. My name is Darren Godfrey. The issues that are paramount in Jersey City are really about economics. All my 20 to 30 years in business, and also as a uh, economic development professional, talks about really this changing the stem of economic development. Jersey City is going through that right now, gentrification. I helped build affordable housing on Ocean Avenue, where we provided tremendous the Dr. Lena Edwards property. We did that. We did that because we understand Ocean Avenue needs to change. So does MLK. It can't be just the Gold Coast. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Brittany Clay Brooks. I am happy to be here. I want to thank the local chapter NAACP and its women for having us. I am a former councilwoman in the city of East Orange. I am an urban planner, a community organizer, and I have worked at the federal level on issues like housing, health care, and economic development. I also previously was the planning director of the city of Plainfield. I have three questions that have guided my life as I also have grown up in the system in foster care um, and having two parents be incarcerated for most of my childhood. That is, why are people living better than others? Why are people struggling and what are we going to do about that? And I look forward to talking to you today about exactly what we plan to or I plan to do about that. Good evening, everyone, beautiful people. I am Deborah Salters, warrior for the people. I am running for this congressional seat because I am tired of more of the same. We put the people in office, and legacy and history are more important than the struggles of the people. That is why I'm running. Um, and, you know, everyone wants to pass it to the next one, to the next one, but what about the folks who are in need? I'm looking at the congressional fighting amongst themselves. They don't have time for we the people. They're too busy fighting with each other for nonsense. So that's why I'm here, to make a difference and to make a change and bring life to our people and to District 10. Because we matter and someone needs to put us first. And that is what I plan to do. Jersey City, and I'm 
here because I'm running for office because I love to serve the people. Uh, quite quite. I, people who serve people are the life of our community. And like um, the sentiment already said, um, I want to stop the tide of that. I already have worked in this community, bring $30 million in federal grants to um, spend the tide of uh, help, uh, at health care, education, opportunities to district, as well as uh, created um, relationships between the federal, uh, between the city, state, uh, county, nonprofits, and um, educational institutions to help greater economic development. So please, please, please vote for me. So hello, everyone. My name is Sheila Montague. And I'm a lifelong educator. I've been um, a New Jersey licensed educator for the last 25 years. And I've been on the fight to save our kids and I've been on the fight to save our communities. I've done that by being active in the NAACP, POP, People's Organization for Progress. I fought to help get our local our schools back into local control, which we were able to do that. I fought to get the Flint, Michigan water activists here in our state to make sure that we force the issue to be addressed in the city of Newark. Um, and the three main things that um, I want to address once I get to Congress is the book banning. As a teacher, I think that's atrocious. I want to address the women's rights that are being um, stopped on now. And um, I also want to address our voters' rights. I want to attack the 2025, Project 2025. I want to make sure that we have a voice for reparations because it's needed. We have to get things out of the committee and get them where they need to be. I want to make sure that we have oversight. Too much money is coming to our communities and we're not seeing where it is. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Flora, public school teacher for 20 years right here in Jersey City, where I spent almost my entire life. Uh, I'm a father of three, three presidents, I should say, Kennedy and Kennedy Grant, and I do have their endorsements. You know, we're, we're all up here trying to win tonight, but the biggest win was the NAACP women who decided to host this event and bring this information and the live interaction of candidates to Jersey City. I really look forward to expanding on my platform a little bit, but it's basically this, our shared future as a planet and as an issue that entails climate change, affordable housing crisis, and New York and Jersey City. It talks about universal pre-k for every child across this district, and I look forward to expanding on that one. Thanks for having us. So, and, and, and the Jersey folks know, uh, I, I'm into 
to so many different things. Education is one of my biggest platforms. I also love the seniors. Uh, I have a group here that seems on the move. And, and I, I just feel really strongly going down to Washington and getting things done. And I, and I know how to cross that out uh, because I have a lot of different uh, Republican friends too. We all got to get along somehow. So, yeah. Thank you.
create those categories of the minority to really put the needs specifically for Jersey City residents and American descendants of slavery and their struggle specifically in Jersey City, Greenville neighborhood where I was born and raised on Grand Avenue. Thank you. in Congress and campaign was a great advocate for our communities and whatever um, monies that we needed. But I also want to say that oversight is really, really important. There's a lot of money that comes from the federal government for so many different things, but the money just doesn't seem to trickle down where they need to be. Right now, we have lots of minorities or young men who have their license to do the work, right? But they're not being hired to do it. So if the money is coming from the federal government, but somehow the oversight is not being done to make sure the money is doing what it's supposed to do, that's a problem. And we need people in place who are not afraid to speak out about that. We need people in place who like Congressman Payne, um, because he's from doing the same place I'm from, that have always been on the ground, who already know the issues. And it's not just about the policy, but it's about knowing the people. So I would say the biggest thing that we have to do is to ensure that the money gets here, because it's already been earmarked, and that when it gets here, we do what needs to be done. Thank you. Jerry Walker and 
I'm going to see you know, he said he's actually doing it well but still I'm actually doing that work when we talk about infrastructure I'm going to date myself a little bit when we built the new Giant Stadium Scanso was the developer I designed a program where the subs got their money immediately they didn't have to wait for the big guys money and that was key because most of the subs were NBEs and WBEs that's how you create real generational wealth. Make sure the money that is financed comes from the government is given to the people who are doing the work. So uh, I'm a firm believer in opportunity, and this is a great opportunity for the underserved districts. When money gets sent down and it gets dispersed to family and friends and big business, and I think you guys have all been reading in the uh, papers, how deputy mayors are, are giving their friends jobs and now they're getting indicted. A lot of people are getting indicted for taking the money that the federal government is sending down to the underserved districts and using it for their own little piggy bank and work. That's going to stop. There's no need for it. When the money goes down, they're going to be held accountable under my watch. And if they're not, the federal government is going to come in and we're going to say, now we're running the project. Everybody should have an opportunity. I was given an opportunity. I made my dreams come true. We're going to make dreams come true again. And everybody's going to have a better future. Believe me when I tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. Here again. I think the operative word here is congressional oversight. I think all too often dollars are sent down and they're just not being looked over properly. And Lyndon, here's what we've done. We've got close to $2 billion worth of investment in that town. And I tell you, if you're hiring, if you're not hiring my local people, you are not going to be building anything. I'm not going to hire you up a fire truck. I'm not going to hire you up a fire truck and block the, the work site. I will. And they know it. When they come to Linden, they're hiring Linden people. That is it. If you don't hire Linden people, you don't work here. Allocated 
to the people who live in the city and who work in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, so I'm not the best at political jargon, so I'm just going to make a plan. I think the question was about how we're going to improve the actual infrastructure. Right now, uh, before he passed away, uh, my good friend and mentor, Congressman Payne, already had infrastructure money earmarked, and we're starting to see that delivered already. One of them is sewer improvements in the city of Hillside. The other one was training uh, station investments in Brick Church and East Orange. And it, the list goes on and on and on. That is what we have to do. When we are on committees like infrastructure, you have to ask, thank you, for money and figuring out where those projects should go. Right now, our transit systems are subpar in the state of New Jersey. Right now, we are looking for ways to fix our streets in the state of New Jersey. Right now, we are trying to figure out how our built infrastructure via the Green New Deal, which is already in Congress, is going to address the way that we build our buildings and the standards by which we build them and who we are going to hire to build them. That is where we ought to start with infrastructure. Hiring people, thank you, yes, is one thing, but how we're going to improve it so that you can see it and use it well is another thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. My next question will be for the last three. 
And this question is about recidivism rates, reentry programs. What would, what would you do to, or would you write any legislation? Would you be in support of um, reentry programs, education programs, and housing assistance to reduce recidivism rates? And would you do anything to change on applications? The criminal background history question and pending charges for indictments for employers to um, take that out. Loaded question, thank you. Um, I quickly be back to the last one. Mental health, not only for a crisis intervention, but also for police officers who are walking the beat. Yeah. Sometimes they have trauma and things going on. Back to recidivism. I just had this conversation with a constituent in New York who said his words, they're making it so hard for us. Everything's online, but I don't have broadband access. We don't even have the device. I go down to resources in Essex County, the laptop keys are stuck. Now this is, this is somebody who was incarcerated trying to come out, looking for housing, looking for opportunity. I am a proponent of anything we can do to reduce rates of people re-entering prison re-entering struggle, anything to uplift them. Uh, particularly, there was a movement in Jersey City in Martin's place, the students that teach. We uh, performed at the grand opening. I'm hearing mixed things in Jersey City about how that rolled out, because uh, it wasn't enough. It was a, it was a, a prototype, but uh, definitely I would love to sit on the subcommittee, earmark funds, possibly some federal block grants to try to give local municipalities a chance to do that. Thank you. Can you repeat the question for me, please? For the you don't mind. It's a long question. I was trying to condense it a little bit. Okay. But basically, the question is asking Would you be in stance on increasing educational programs, career and housing assistance when you release individual, incarcerated individuals to reduce, to reduce recidivism? So the answer is yes. Um, actually, I worked with Congressman Payne. We actually worked with a few other federal prisons um, in regards to getting them programs and funding so that, that when they come home, because a lot of them come home and they don't have, they don't even know how to get their social security card. And so the main thing for us is to develop some type of programming. I actually run an organization that's called March for Equity where we provide social equitable opportunities, getting people jobs and businesses and, and having them learn how they can get reacclimated to society. So a lot of the times what's happening in our communities is that when these people come home, the recidivism they're going back to jail because they don't have training programs that can help them get into some type of GED program or some type of entrepreneur or some type of trade. So although it is a local issue, I would definitely earmark funds that we can establish more programming in the district, in, in Jersey City, you know, as well as the variation all throughout the, the district. Thank you. Lee made Greer uh, Cunningham, Lee Cunningham, he was a big advocate for second chance programs. Um, he really did a good job with that. And also our former Senator Cunningham, uh, she had this, this legislation down in the state ban a box. So you can't be, you know, obviously put into a, a, a box in a category and say, you know, you can't be allowed to get this job. But I believe that, you know, each department of our city and our counties should have a second chance program not just the parks, uh, because we do have some talented people that, that do get caught up you know, early in their lives, uh, making mistakes, et cetera. So I'm, I'm a component of the second chance, but I also believe in the first chance. You know, when you talk about education, I believe we would educate our people uh, better. They would be, it'd be a better response in the community. There'd be less people getting incarcerated, because it's difficult. When you come out of jail, it's this, this difficult situation. People gotta trust you. Um, so it's something that, that's definitely in, in my soul work. This next question will be for all of the candidates. As it is a very serious issue that we have here. How do you address, how would you plan on addressing the housing crisis and develop legislation to change the verbiage from affordable housing to low income housing for families who do not meet the requirements for income minimums? And would you help make it easier for first-time buying programs and want access to those first-time buying programs for your constituents? Sorry, you missed the word. Yeah, well, you know, affordable. You know, affordable houses, not affordable anymore. Um, 
they make someone like $62,000. And I can tell you, not a lot of people in my community make $62,000. And this is something that, that's, that I deal with every day. I get so many calls of people being displaced. It's something that we gotta really, really uh, pay attention to. So it's gotta be low to my income. And I think from the city council perspective, uh, putting together some legislation to say make it mandatory for some of these developers to put affordability into their projects. But a lot of these developers come in as a as right and they, they just do market rates and that's not the, that's not the case here. And we need some people to be strong in Washington that can put some legislation together that can come down the pipe to, to, to local uh, cities. And I, I just know that Jersey City is a real issue in Jersey City with affordability right now. I mean, a one bedroom apartment supposed to be affordable to be $1,800. And, and I can tell you back in the day, when I was growing up, you get one bedroom apartment for $500. So we gotta figure out how to get back to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, in regards to um, the question, affordable, more so that's what they termed it, this was like decades ago when they basically introduced the term. But I think what I would do, not necessarily think, I know what I would do is one thing, we need to amend the AMI. Because, you know, it's a lot of, the, the times are different. You know, after COVID, everything just seemed to skyrocket. And I think more so analyzing that first. In regards to programs, there are, you know, from a federal perspective, um, is that so Section 8. Section 8 is actually funded through the federal government, right? And so they're, they're rolling out programs that will help individuals buy houses, and that's all throughout the area. But I would also increase funding for such programs, as well as there's a, a program called NACA. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's, it is a local program, but it's federally funded with variation of rules that we have implemented. But the main thing is training people on how they need to uh, get funding for their houses. Thank you. Mr. Farrell, before you answer, I just want to note that the question is particularly discussing changing that verbiage from affordable housing to low income to address the families who are not meeting those income requirements. Excellent distinction, thank you. A lot of people aren't aware, of my time down in DC, two years of the Grad School of Political Management, we looked at mandatory versus discretionary funding. If you can sit on a committee and help to change the verbiage and a portion, just a little bit of that discretionary money over to mandatory budgets that come to local governments to change the thresholds and change the amounts, and anybody with low income is suddenly into housing that they can afford. So this, this is definitely a matter of sitting on the right committees and moving money from you know, discretionary areas into mandatory funding for constituents. Also, I'm going to say that I walk around this district, a lot of our own house neighbors in Newark, there is so much unused space in Newark right now that can be repurposed with mental health services, substance abuse services. So we're not just giving people a dwelling space with low income, we're giving them the services that they need to permanently be housed and be well contributing members to our society and our district. Thank you. Thank you. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. I just want to stop right there. We're not ensuring domestic tranquility because that starts at home. Charity starts at home. But we're allotting so much money for people who are coming into our country at a time that we were told that we weren't allowed to have reparations because there were just no money. We can't allow for that to happen anymore on a federal level. In the 60s, we had three, um, there were three things that we got from the whole civil rights movement. Right? We got um, education, educational rights, equity, allegedly. Um, we had voter rights and housing. So they're going back on those rights. And again, it, it brings us to Project 2025. We need people who are courageous enough to speak for us on our behalf that we need reparations. And we can change the terminology all we want to, and, and I'm for that. But when we change the terminology, we can't do anything without the money. We need the money, we deserve the money, we are Americans and we have to stand on that.
And so I said, for $30 million on over supply right now, I hope they get another $30 million to build more houses throughout the district. That's doing the work. Uh, first of all, I, I do agree with uh, Ms. I'm sorry, Salters um, and Ms. Playbrooks. Number one, change in the name is going to make a difference. You have to change the policy. And the policy, you know, I think one of the limits was 29, he made $29,000, you don't qualify for this, 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 this. Uh, this is ludicrous. We want our people to live. We want our people to eat. We don't want people eating peanut butter and jelly every day. It's just not right. Uh, I look at this, I look at, I hear constantly about affordable housing, affordable housing, and you hear it constantly for decades now. And it's limited to what has been done. But you could build a big building, you could build a thousand units, and you only allow a hundred people. Do you know we probably have about three or four thousand people in one specific area that can't afford to live at home? And we're giving money to legal immigrants. Bottom line. Sad. Here's what we did with it. Well, first of all, we, we, we meet our requirements, our low-income housing requirements. But here's what we did with we, we set aside $2 million uh, to allow uh, people who can't afford to purchase homes or low to buy their income families. We, we give them up to $30,000 for down payment. Okay. Uh, and we put in our budget years to come, a million dollars every year, so that young people or people who are trying to buy homes will be able to afford to buy homes. I think all too often, as much as we're here as um, to be congressmen, we rely on federal dollars, but I think we have the abilities in our own towns that we just manage our money a little bit better and we can create housing for our people in the towns. That's what happens. And as much as we're creating housing, we're creating jobs so that our people can afford to be in those houses that, that we're trying to provide them. So again, we give up the $30,000 towards the down payment to work with banks, and the banks are cooperating with us to help these people get into homes. Thank you. So for the next question, I also would like um, all of you to answer this question. Project 2025 has come up more than once. So I would like to know what would you do if elected to attack the um, proposed Project 2025 in particular with the defunding or taking away of a lot of the programs such as Social Security Disability, Medicaid, Section 8, funding all of those programs, what would you do to dismantle that program? Yes, I'm sorry. First thing we have to do is get behind someone who's going to win the election because we're going to all be in big trouble if, uh, if, if Donald Trump wins. The second thing, in Washington, it seems to be no cooperation. Uh, you know, we know we have a lot of Democrats who really are pushing through these programs. You have a lot of Republicans who are just going the opposite way just because they, because they, if you say potato, I say potato. And I think we have to try to build a consensus with some of our Republicans. Uh, we just cross the aisle because it's going to take votes on both sides to, to make this happen. So to me, like my interest is build consensus uh, to keep these programs alive. So I'm going to do some reading on Project 2025. Don't believe they'll hit all the sequel. That ain't going to happen. They're, uh, like Mr. Armstead said, um, we need to work for us. I'm the only Republican up on this table. Um, and I'm up here with a lot of good people. It's just a matter of working with each other. You can read all you want. The media is just trying to push this narrative. It's not true. It's not going to happen. If it, if even under my watch, I will not allow some of the things that are they're talking about in uh, in Project 2025. It's ludicrous. You, you'll, you'll never, it'll never, it'll never pass. Uh, but uh, I I look forward to being your congressman and working across the aisle and stopping the nonsense and working towards fixing problems, not just adding to media's uh, quote unquote uh, lives to the public and making them think that people are uh, bad people, because they're not. Thank you. My mom always said, keep it simple, stupid. And what she meant by that, this vote. If we vote and come out vigilant and make sure that the leader of 2025 gets in, 
it handles everything. This is not a you know, we have to debate this. We have to vote because if he's allowed to get in one more time, we're going to see things that happen that's going to erode all the issues that we know are important to our community. So I can say on July 16th, vote for me number one, and I will be that to say thank you. Thank you. I agree with the idea of voting and voting for the person that we have put up. I think there's a lot of drama going on, and I'm trying to go to Congress and put a muzzle on it. Uh, one of the things that I'll do is make sure that I'm remaining centered enough to improve on what we already have, be my experience, and progressive enough to create policies and things that are not already there. I think once we get into election cycle, we get to talking about what's not happening in government and all these things. And we fail to mention sometimes some of the things that are happening and focus on those things. And there's nothing that you can do, thank you, to convince me that Democrats as a whole will come together and make sure that they don't push that. And for those Republicans who are more moderate, who also represent poorer areas, they likely are not going to be for it too. But we have to work together on that because probably 2025 will gut a lot of stuff. And that is only going to benefit the richer people we know that our district is not that. So, I'm not a bandwagon jumper, and 2025 is a distraction, okay? There's a whole lot going on. Pay attention and read it. Um, everything in front of 2025 is not a bad thing. So what I'm saying to you is, people, I need you to pay attention to what is going on. Do not vote out of fear. Do not be railroaded, pretty much like, oh, oh my God, what are you gonna do? Oh my God, they're saying this, they're saying that. Do not be sheep led to slow. That was done by Jesus, okay? Open your eyes, pay attention, read Project 2025, don't believe the hype, do not be pushed in a direction that you really don't want to go in. Vote wisely, not because of legacy or history, because you could be the first and the worst. You understand what you see? Vote wisely, okay? Pay attention. Read 2025 for yourself. Don't believe the hype. Okay, now I'm going to grab some food high So, you really pay attention, folks. So, I, like my colleagues, don't believe that we are going to let Project 2025 go through. Part of it is we have to watch out for it. It's attack on, um, uh, it's an ability to become authoritarian, right? So we have to make sure that it doesn't stop on our civil liberties, right? So those are the things that we really have to watch out for in 2025. We can't erode these systems because they are support systems. That's how people who are lesser survive. Uh, I have a son who was shot when he was nine years old. And as a result, he was on security. They literally told me that he came in so scared because I gave him food and shelter. He's 25 years old. And they count it as income to them. So we have to be watching out for these things because at that point, I'm not going to put my son out of the house, but literally I would have to go throw him out for what for him to get what he needs. So we really have to watch out for these uh, buzzwords and make sure we um, full of for you. So I feel a lot differently about Project 2025, and I wanted, because we have a short amount of time, to talk about two issues. Them striking the um, Department of Education is a huge deal, especially when we have students where I live in North scoring four out of five not passing the state standardized test. That's the floor, not the ceiling. So when they scratch out the Department of Education, who are we going to have to enforce that educational equity we talked about that was attained from the rights in the 1960s? That's huge. And also, we're talking about the police immunity, right? We're talking about a government who gave an agent, who put up an Asian crime bill, but we still don't have anything. And you're talking about giving police immunity, but you're not talking about giving subpoena power to the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. That can't happen. So I would be willing to say that those are the two biggest issues, but Project 2025 is real.
The way we make 25 not happen is by stopping the public fighting of Democrats. Make your party publicly. Make their decision privately and come out strong together, Democrats. Uh, I'm more concerned about Project 2024 right now with the Supreme Court taking away Chevron deference. Let's just make decisions about our environment and emissions. Let's take away a woman's right to choose. Let's criminalize people falling asleep in Oregon. How about that one? You fall asleep in Oregon, you're going to jail because you're unhoused. What about giving the president immunity, unilateral immunity to do what he will? And he's not even the president yet, and they're already setting him up for that. So I'm worried about Project 24, Supreme Court of the United States, six for you conservative Democrat. Thank you. So there's four main policies in regards to the Project 2024. The main one that I have a problem with is the dismantling of the Ministry of State. That means Social Security, because a lot of people in here are affected by Social Security, housing, education, it's going to be eliminated. In addition, if you are a civil servant and you work, you will no longer have a job. So the reality is, we need to focus on getting them out of there. And in addition, one of the key points that they have is American centerpiece of a poor family, right? Which they're trying to eliminate abortion, which they've already done. But the main thing is, if Trump is in office, we are in trouble. And that's the reality. And the point is, is that in regards to abortion, women need abortion for health. It's a health right, you know, for abortion. And I don't want someone telling me what I can do with my body. And I'm sure a lot of other women don't either. But also, individuals that are poor and on Social Security will no longer have it. So I think as I, I actually agree with my colleagues in regards to making sure that a Democrat is in office, I think that is key. And one last thing. I'm almost done. Okay. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues on what they're saying. We definitely have to vote and make sure that we have a Democratic president. Uh, 2025 is, you know, it's, it's a tricky situation. It gives cuts to the, the corporate, the top people that, that, you know, make some money. And I don't think that's fair. I think corporate should pay their share in terms of tax dollars. And I also think, and I also agree with my colleagues in terms of 2024. With, with the Supreme Court ruling, making that ruling about women's rights, I think that's terrible. I think, um, you know, when you talk about women, I, you know, women is, is such a key component of our society, and they need to be respected like that. And I believe if we had a woman president right now, it would be in a situation. And, and I believe if, if Hillary Clinton was there, we wouldn't be in a situation. So in terms of that, I, I really believe that we have to stand up and we have to push back, and we also have to come together. The parties seem a little stagnated right now, and we have to come together. We can't be having these public fights as what's going on in Congress right now. Thank you. Women's reproductive rights and overturn. 
determine this Supreme Court's decision against me? Well, first thing I would do once I'm elected, I would definitely draw up impeachment uh, for some of those Supreme Court members, especially Clarence Thomas, because he's violating a lot of uh, issues that are happening. Uh, that would be number one. But also, in regards to, there is legislation, but I would definitely increase legislation in regards to supporting and making it so that federally, that it would blanket over the United States as opposed to states. The state federal overrides the state. So any state laws that they make federally more so. And I, you know, it's, it hurts, it's my heart, me being someone that um, has gone through IVF and even, you know, had birth control, being a teenager, for them to take that away for my, you know, nieces and, and younger generations that are coming ahead, it's just appalling. So I would definitely partner with various groups of organizations as well as congressional members to try to fix, fix the problem that we have now. Thank you. Everybody has a mother. Take a second and thank you, mother, for all she's done. Uh, there is no place for government to tell women what to do. Number one, I agree on impeachment. If the Supreme Court justice is being bought and it's not at the highest level of our government to be neutral and impartial, they need to go. Number two, we can change term limits for our Supreme Court justices. Instead of them having lifetime appointments, how about it's time to set a term limit? Another tactic, if elected to Congress, we can change the number of justices to create an ideological balance on the Supreme Court instead of being 66-33, I think 50-50 will look nice. So if that entails increasing the size of the Supreme Court, then that's what we need to do. Thank you for the question. So definitely as a woman, I believe that we should stand um, to not support the well, to support the reversing of Roe v. Wade at this time to make sure that we support that. Um, however, I think that we also should, also should pay attention to those ones that um, in Congress who um, we need to follow the money. Like why are they voting against women's rights? And also I think we need to be very mindful now moving forward that it's not all about being fearful of Donald Trump. And I get that, but we need to be more issue-based. And we need to follow to see, even us with candidates here, how many of you, you know, hypothetically just look to see what it is that we do stand for. You know, it can't be about feel good anymore. We gotta pay attention to what's going on because we got Juneteenth, but we didn't get reparations. Other races who have a lot of money, they're not really concerned with who the president is. We want what is owed to us, and we got to stay consistent about that. We want the land that was, was taken away, everything we're supposed to get, Thank we you. want it. Okay, I just got pointed out that I am my side, so everybody knows I'm Alberta Gordon. <laughs> so uh, I definitely would support what he said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm down here, um, to limit terms of the Supreme Court justices. But bigger than that, I definitely support a woman's right to choose and IVF because more and more these young ladies, they're doing their thing. They, they're not trying to go and have babies and get married early, so they shouldn't have the right to be able to um, have IVF treatments. I support um, Planned Parenthood and would love to make sure that we have the right to choose. And, and that is, should be the law line. We just need to read say Roe v. Wade, and those people who don't support it, we need to get on the bandwagon and get them out of there. Because as long as there's women in this community, we should have the right to do whatever we want with our body. And no other thing to say. Can I ask you to repeat your question, please? Responsible. 
okay? And we need to go back to educating our children on sexual activities so that they understand the responsibility. Having sex is a responsibility, okay? It's not just let me get it and quit. No, you have a responsibility, first of all, for your health, and if you bring a child into this world, don't bring them into chaos. So again, abortion is not contraception, but we should have our own right to say what we want to do. But at the same time, I would reverse what they've done in reversing Roe v. Wade. I, I support women's rights overall. Thank you. I believe most of the panel has talked about how much we support the, old, the, the reversal of that decision. One of the things that I do in the meantime is travel to help other Democrats get elected. One of the things that I've done in my career is help people in conservative towns understand how if you are a poor or middle class person, regardless of your color, your Republican representative does not care about you when they make these decisions. And so you have to make sure we're getting more people elected, traveling, doing that work. I've done it in Virginia when they did it in Expand Medicaid and I was working for Obamacare. We have to continue to do that work. New Jersey is democratic. We are a good state with respect to our reproductive rights and our laws, but there are plenty of people who do not support that at the federal level. Finally, I do think we also, we also ought to be supporting legislation like the Monomus Act, and I see you coming with the 30 seconds, I'm gonna wrap up. I think we should be supporting legislation like the Monomus Act that directly addresses black maternal health, because we know that we are not being taken care of in our healthcare system the same way as other people, and that's something that we have to address. As a woman with fibroid tumors and a whole lot going on, that's important because we are experiencing racism regardless of our income. And that's important. Thank you. Once I'm elected to Congress, I would immediately talk about the universal and work with my Republican can colleagues here to make sure it's done immediately. I mean, this is not a man's right. This is a woman's right. I was raised by a single mother, and she raised five of us by herself. Also, I, my whole life is surrounded by women. My wife of 30, 40 years, high school sweetheart sitting right there, tells you it's all about the women. And they lead us. We, we men are very macho, but it's all about the women. And we got to make sure we support them. And to have a conversation about their rights is sickening and un really unconstitutional if we ask them. Thank you. Are you ready? <laughs> Listen. Uh, we all remember COVID, right? Yeah. They made us take needles, and what did COVID turn out to be? Nothing.
we need to get some of these old farts out. She said, I'm an old fart, and it's time to get some of that out because they don't come around anymore. They don't knock doors anymore. We call them, that office doesn't respond anymore. We don't see them at the town halls anymore. And how do so many people leave Congress as millionaires? How does that happen when they come and look at like teachers and nurses and construction workers? The last thing I'll say, very simple. House of Representatives, two terms, maybe three. Senate, no more than two terms. Supreme Court, definitely needs term limits. Because lifetime appointments are not working as we can see. Thank you for the question. So, in regards to term limits, I just want to kind of talk about a few things, right, locally, kind of like what we're all actually experiencing. So, I think there should be term limits, right? But in regard to Congress and what I was working on with the congressman is that it takes a few cycles to get things passed, especially when you're in D.C. and Washington, because everybody doesn't agree. So there should be term limits, but the main thing is, the question is, how long are the term limits, you know? And as we were talking, it's what help we talked amongst ourselves. You know, there's certain things that, there's certain people that are in power that actually provide limitations for others. You know, they, some people stay in a seat for a long time because some people direct them into saying, you have to keep this person here. And that person might not be right for them. As the elder, and I've been going through the district too, and I've been advised, so some of the people, even on a local level, have not been providing the support that they're supposed to. So I think more so understanding what the term limits should be. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I do support term limits. Uh, I also uh, would, would have to put a matrix to that in, in terms of the job that they're doing. Uh, I think Congress, to be honest, I think it should be four years, not two years. Um, because like every year you're gonna be running again. You can't really think about you know, your constituents because you gotta run a campaign. So I do believe in term limits. Um, but also, you know, you gotta believe in the job that you're doing too. Like if you're not bringing resources back to your constituents, you should really be not representing. You know, a lot of people get a lot of people get real complacent when they get to Washington and they worry about themselves. And like my colleagues were saying, they do go down there and get rich. It's, it's inside training. Like you, you get tipped off before, and I don't think it's fair either. Like Congress and Senate, when when the stock market go up and down, they the first ones to know. You know what they do? They call their friends up and they say, "Look, get out of there." You know, they, they get little kickbacks from that too. So I really believe in term limits. I believe in, uh, you know, all right, thank you. I was just getting started. Thank you. So we're coming to a close. Um, I want to give each of you an opportunity to just summarize everything that you have discussed, your policies, what you plan to do if you're elected. And if you could please end that answer the question, there is a Jersey City um, office, Congress office, and I wanted to know, as you answer this question, if you would be keeping that office open. We're gonna start with the mayor of Linden, Mr. Derek Harrison. Yes, uh, first of all, in Linden, I ran without the backing of the political machine and political bosses. I cut taxes for seven years in a row, I generated revenue through redevelopment. I expanded services to our seniors. I ensured our economy is responsive to our residents. I created housing programs, and I created jobs. In fact, I raised the median income in my town. We no longer are qualified to be considered an urban economic zone, okay? I think that I'm the right guy to go to Washington. We're looking for a fight, we're looking for a guy to get things done, that's me. I have a proven track record. And I will deliver for the constituents of the 10th district. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just go back and forth. I'm going to ask Ms. Clay Brooks to answer that question, and then we'll come back to you, Ms. Thank you. And don't forget to answer if you're going to keep the office in Jersey City. Please, answer your question. Yes, so thank you. I, so let me first say that I will keep the office open. I believe that government oversight is important, but also making sure that people are educated, making sure we have a place for them to go to receive those services. So not only will the office stay open, but there will be somebody designated to make sure that people know when grants are coming, 
to make sure that people are able to come to that office and get help applying for those grants. It's something that I've made sure that I've dedicated my governmental career to. And finally, I do plan on going to Congress, thank you so much for the 30 second warning, and fighting for what's real. And we have to know that even though we live in a democratic law in New Jersey, that is not the case at the federal level. And as a person who has had a job in government and appointed by a Republican and still protesting that same Republican, for gun law change, that is the same attitude I'm planning to carry to Congress, because we don't need a lot of jargon. We need somebody who's going to get the job done. I hope that you see and meet someone tonight and someone who can get that job done on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Mr. Pico and then Mr. Sometimes. So thank you all for having me here this evening. I truly appreciate it. Um, based on my background and based on the fact of getting things done, I think that was that's very important, right? We're not down in Congress to fight. Fighting is such a negative word. Our job as elected officials is to negotiate, work with both sides, and enjoy the moment. And you know what? Focus more so on, and Mr. Walker took my line too, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, look, I am a firm believer in people over politics. Uh, I am a firm believer in we can get things done, stop band-aiding, start fixing. Start making sure that the money that goes to these districts is used properly. The last thing I want to say is Jersey City. Uh, if anybody, anybody from Yankee fans here, real quick, because I only have a few seconds. All right, 1995 Yankees had a team that was unbelievable. My team, when I win this election, will be unbelievable. You will get tired of seeing our faces. Thank you. Ms. Yes, I will keep the office open because my office is everywhere you are, okay? I am mobile, so I do not sit in one spot. I am here for the people. People are my passion, and changing lives, transforming lives is what I do. And so as a lowly advocate activist, I have gone to HUD to cause them to open up our abandoned townhouses of our low to moderate income that have been vacant for decades, boarded up for decades, and now he has put out a bid and gotten contractors to come and provide our low to moderate income housing. So the things that I do now on this level being a nobody, when I get to Congress, just imagine how much I will do for District 10 because I'm already getting the work done. Salt just gets the work done. If our people are in need, they call me, I meet them on the street, and we get it done. They need housing, we get it done. They're not being protected by the police, we get it done. And so this is what I'm already doing. You are my passion. I fight for my people. That's why I'm called Warrior for the People every day. This is what I do. This is my life. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Commissioner Walker, we'll go to you. Okay, good. Um, this is first of all, I'd just like to thank my colleagues for coming out to Jersey City today. Uh, yes. I appreciate you guys. And, and I found it a little bit disrespectful that everybody was here, but that's the end. Yeah, but my name is Jerry Walker. I've been, I've been serving the community now for 28 years. Social service has been in my family for 78 years. It's in my DNA to help people. I, mean, I have a lot of colleagues that, that offer me so, so many different positions, but I turned them down. Just recently, one of my great friends, Danny Early, he got offered a $70 million job, but he turned it down. That's our blueprint. We care about people, I care about people, and my colleagues write people before politics. And I do have the ability to cross that out too. I did a lot with the Republican governor, Governor Christie, when he was in office. We brought back to town two million dollars for my after school program. Yeah, so I, I know how to cross that out as well. And that's what it's, it, it takes. It's don't an individual can't get it done, guys. You gotta be a team player, you gotta be able to talk to the other side of the house as well. And I know I have the ability to do that. So, um, in regards to me, and I am a public servant. I was working with a congressman. I was a person in the office that was handling immigration issues, handling social security issues, handling postal issues. So I, I have the federal know-how. 
in regards to me as well. I was an advocate for small businesses, especially here. I worked with your city council president on hosting a, an event with the SBA. I've also worked with a variation of court health organizations in regards to the Congress who had correctable cancer. We worked with them in regards to getting men educated in regards to what the series called Gentlemen Check Your Engines. So think the main thing in regards to me, I, I will be ready on day one. It will be just like another day for me. Everyone else will have a learning curve. And I think the main thing is, Shane Amelius, vote for me on July 16th. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to get to know you to see what you want, and that means that office would have to be open. 
My um, resume extends for a very long period of time. I'm 52 years old. I've always been an advocate for people. My grandmother raised me from Raleigh, North Carolina, so I understand living in a community and building. You gotta share the church and share sugar and, and, and support each other. So I come from that. I come from a place where I know how important healthcare is because I am a cancer survivor. I come from a place where I know how education and how important it is because when my grandparents died and I became homeless in the 12th grade, no one was gonna push me to get not one but two degrees in a community where I've sometimes stepped over crime and dead bodies. So I understand. I've went I've walked the walk, and I've won it every time. I would like to represent you. Please consider that. Thank you. That's going to close our town hall. There are no more questions. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Remember, we can't just come to these town halls. We have to get out and vote. Yeah. July 16th is the primary. September 18th is the general. Please, I'm sorry, early voting does start tomorrow. So if you're not able to make July 16th, get out there tomorrow and vote. We need y'all vote. So I'm going to turn it over to the president of the NAACP, Mr. Charles Mayer.
Jackson, back from news. Good night.